this time you will want to uh, put your, your phones on, on silent mode. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kevin Gaines. I'm the director of the Africana Studies and Research Center. And thank you for, for joining us on this very sunny afternoon. You can see we have to, you know, sort of uh, put the, the, the blinds down so that uh, you all will be able to focus on the talk and not have, you know, be blinded by this uh, dazzling uh, sun. So it's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who is a candidate for the joint ASRC and Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies position. And once again, before I introduce our speaker, uh, on behalf of the search committee and uh, the co-chair, Birba Gosh, I want to acknowledge the uh, indispensable support of Trisica Monroe of F FGSS and Donna Panisi of the ASRC, along with uh, Renee Milligan, uh, whose work has been very much uh, appreciated in uh, making it possible for our candidate uh, to be here today. Sam Tenorio is a doctoral candidate in the Department of African American Studies at Northwestern University. Sam is also a graduate of uh, the University of California, Irvine, with a BA in History and Women's Studies. Sam's dissertation is entitled Slave Ship Ahoy, Black to Anarchy, Western Spatiality, Race Governance, and Black Mobility, uh, with a defense scheduled for May 2018, if not sooner. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> This is not Sam's first visit to Ithaca. Uh, their first visit was under the auspices of the School of Criticism and Theory in 2014. Uh, Sam has presented their work nationally and internationally, including uh, Mexico City, the Netherlands, and Toronto. And the title of Sam's presentation today is Practices of Black Anarchism. And please join me in uh, extending a warm epic of welcome to Sam. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm going to just keep time for this one. Uh, so, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. It's a little bit, there's like some mood lighting in here. <laughs> <laughs> please don't fall asleep. I promise to do my best not to bore you. Um, so today I'm going to be speaking about black anarchism. Um, I'll be exploring the question, why so often haven't we understood black practices as political? I'll answer this question from the perspective of black anarchism as it relates to the Western polity. I will explain what black anarchism is, the context of Western spatiality from which it emerges, and why it has been conventionally excised from our political landscape. Um, before I do that, I'd like to give some context in relation to my uh, wider research. So, my project addresses the carceral state as a legacy of the slave ship, um, the latter being reinscribed in various institutional forms of the 20th century. I argue that contemporary spatialities of anti-black discipline, of which mass incarceration is just one, are better understood when we begin with the slave ship rather than colorblind conceptions of the convict ship or the panopticon. The slave ship provokes a theory, theorization of the ways that both detention and mobility are twin forces in the racial regimes of the modern era and evinces how processes of confinement constitute race and gender categories simultaneously. Um, using a geographical approach, I also argue that the slaves who jump the slave ship provide a political metaphor of spatial disruption and reproductive refusal that I use to explain three historical conjunctures. And so I'm not historian so I get to kind of jump through time. <laughs> um, so the oceanic voyages of the Black Star Line amidst North America's white nation building processes. Um, riotous property destruction in the 1960s urban ghettos, specifically the Watts Rebellion of 65 in California. And Asada Shakur's transnational escape from prison and continued course of exile. By juxtaposing four seemingly unrelated and often unheralded acts of self-immolation and escapism, I mark out remarkably unseen, though controversial, conceptions of political protest, existing amidst the archives that seem almost unable to bear them. Throughout the manuscript, I examine an inextricable link of white placemaking to global processes of race making, and show how the gendered racialization of carceral space meant that differentially disciplined black people disrupted the spatial expressions of white supremacy differently. I conceptualized these spatial disruptions under a rubric of black anarchism and theorized their precarious location in our political imaginaries, 
bound by, materi bound by materially and discursively deploy de deployed tropes of black masculinity and femininity. Emphasizing the constitutive relationships among black confinement, white nation building, and the state's political imagination, I argue that state spaces, state spaces are not neutral and not all political actions are visible. Rather, Western spatialities forge excessively raced and gendered bodies, and Western politics repress the antagonisms and reference of black radical practices. I elucidate this joint work of the Western state as necessary for the reproduction of a global white supremacy and demonstrate the capaciousness of the carceral state. In my talk today, I will be presenting a portion of my first chapter, which in the manuscript provides the conceptual framework and political metaphor that I used to analyze the three other practices of black anarchism that make up my remaining chapters. I will focus on the slave jumping the slave ship, a political phenomenon that has been under-theorized as such. But looking at the jump allows us to do three things. One, it allows us to see the ways in which black mobilization occurs in the very field of governance that seeks to segregate, atomize, and altogether contain black movement and sociality. Two, it allows us to see black politics in a new light shifting our understanding away from formal politics by rethinking those methods of political action that have been popularly perceived as non-political. And three, it invites us to think deeply about the conventional and inherited structures of the Western polity, specifically about the unknown. So I want to begin by briefly talking about the inspiration for this work, uh, my inspiration for thinking about black politics differently, and a literary encapsulation of the relationship of black anarchism to the Western polity, and it's somewhat of an unlikely source. <laughs> so the work of Herman Melville has been a touchstone of contemporary political theory. How many folks have read Moby Dick, or been forced to read? <laughs> <laughs> we got some believers in here, okay. Um, in his opus, Moby Dick, scholars traditionally look to the whale, to Ahab, and to Ishmael. But what if we looked at Pitt? the most insignificant of the crew, a deckhand, and the only African-American aboard the whaling ship? What if I told you that Moby Dick is actually a treatise on the illegibility of black politics? If you're unfamiliar with the tale, the story is narrated by Ishmael, the only survivor of Captain Ahab's monomaniacal quest for revenge against a giant white whale that had bitten off his lower leg during the previous encounter. On one occasion, Pip is forced to work on one of the whaling boats with second mate Stubb. Pip, scared of whales, jumps out of the boat. They pull him back in, losing a prized whale in the process. Stubb chastises him, telling him that a whale is worth more than the price Pip would fetch on an auction block in Alabama, and commands him to stick to the boat. Pip jumps again. After beginning to drown, left behind by the small whaling boats, he's picked up by the other crew members, but he's not the same. After his rescue, they say he's mad, claiming he mutters and babbles incoherently. He speaks of runaway slaves, of black boys being host to white men, and of unknown worlds. But no one understands him. Pip's jump comes to us via Ishmael's narration, rendering Pip's own demise into a speculation of Ishmael's own relationship to the world, concerned only with his own coming abandonment. But a black anarchist reading breaks through the parameters of meaning even if the imaginaries that it proposes are disavowed via the narrator's authority. Pip's rejection of the ship's racial order, epitomized in his physical refusal of Stubb's invocation of his slave price, is denied within the confines of Ishmael's narration. And Pip's babbling seems to indicate a new social order that he sees but cannot be tra translated to Western word. Pip's jump and Ishmael's narration of his jump introduces my central question. Why haven't we understood black practices as political? Pip's jump marks a particular political practice. It's um, to, one thing to note that Moby Dick is written, it's published in 1851, and in 1840 you have Turner's painting, um, the slave ships circulating around Europe. In 1851 also Democracy in America is being published. So it's a, it's a very unique time. Um, his jump evokes, Pip's jump evokes the historical instances of slaves who jumped the slave ships during the Middle Passage. These black slaves, most often black women, who went unfettered aboard the ship, launched themselves into the ocean and in so doing, or in doing so, disarranged the constitutive relationships of the slave ship, of master and slave, of proprietor and property, of container and contained. 
but little attention has been paid to this practice of political anatomy in comparison to allegedly more direct forms of resistance. What provokes our hesitation about the self-immolating slave? What would it mean to look here instead of here? Pip's jump and the jumps of actual slaves encapsulate a formation of black politics that need to be discerned. While I argue for a black anarchist account of these jumps, it is important to clarify that this account arrives within a larger schema of black politics, where the latter is understood to signal the challenge to racial inflection of government. Black politics is the disruption of the requirements and relationships drawn by a colonial racial terms of order. Black anarchism, a species of black politics, then refers to the practices that enact new ways of being through an exertion of racial chaos in violation of the centralized authority of whiteness. As a practice of self-immolation and escapism, the slave who jumps the slave ship illumines an ever-expansive white authority at the dehumanizing cost of the slave position and disruptively re-inhabits the immobilizing boundaries that constitute the racial order aboard the ship. Challenging the colonial racial state but running counter to dominant definitions of political opposition, the practice of jumping the slave ship sits uncomfortably in an archive that cannot bear it. Yet I am not attempting to recover it as a resistance to offer a corrective. Instead, I appreciate its unrecognizability. I grasp the critical purchase of the jump as it enunciates the limit of our political understanding and offers one glimpse at the antagonism of black anarchist protest to the Western liberal tradition. By plumbing the relationship of these practices to the colonial racial system of governance in which they occur as dissent, but which popularly narrate them as non-political, one stands to question our conventional definitions of black politics as electoral, state-centered, procedural, and based on a model of means and ends, which often circumscribe our interpretations of what it means to practice radical politics. But to understand the black anarchistic inflection of the slaves jump from the slave ship, we must first break from a conception of the slave ship as simply a place where slavery occurred, and instead appreciate the central role played by the ship as a spatial apparatus that constitutes the chattel slave. As such, when the slave jumps, she disrupts not only a single space, but the social order that is both constituted and maintained by its built environment. This, the system of governance, this Western regulation that is experienced by both Pip and the slaves he comes to represent, is at once a set of requirements and a system of confinements. The intimacy of the, of the ship brought with it an anxiety of maintaining divisions, and spatial mechanisms were implemented to counter this proximity. Enslavement is containment, pace Stephanie Camp. And its defining characteristic aboard the slave ship was the barricado. This was a strong wooden barrier, 10 feet high, that bisected the ship near the main mast and extended about two feet over each side of the vessel. Spiked and fitted with swivel guns at the top, as well as peepholes through which the crew could fire pistols and muskets. The wall was used to keep the male from the female slaves, but also as a defensive barrier behind which the crew could retreat onto the female side to quell insurrections. Ultimately, it was an installation added to the ship whenever the slaves were on the main deck, from which the crew guarded and controlled the slave. So rather than think of space as an inert and or empty vessel that we simply occupy, scholars of space have challenged us to consider how space produces particular bodies, identities, and positions. From this perspective, space is a medium that is constantly being made by its dynamic constitutive elements. Though plans and structures do not set our absolute limits, Spatial environments are the context for everyday life and the expression of social relations. The slave ship is designed and produced through labor, but its meaning and its reality as a space are formed and transformed by how it is perceived and lived by social actors. Rather than continue to propagate the narrative that the ships of the Middle Passage are simply a bastardization of an otherwise respectable history of maritime architecture, I espouse Lefebvre's theory that, quote, Physical space has no reality without the energy that is deployed within it. The use of space is the constitution of that space. In fact, we peel away at the sterile rationality that is often applied to architecture when we realize that in reality, the slave ship itself administers a relation of race-gender domination. The slave ship comes into being as it houses the slaves, regulating their movement, propagating their torture, and preventing their escape. 
The narrative that maintains architecture's innocence is only possible because of a reliance on the illusion of transparency, wherein space is understood as being free of secrecy. This is not to say that the forces that produce the slave ship should be confused with or reduced to ideology in such a way that privileges a fully in de developed intentionality behind each mechanism, but rather understood as practices that constitute and codify relationships in the ship's socius. The slave ship is an architecture that emerges in its operation. Those consigned to its journey, journey are equally made according to these practices, orientation by a determination of how these bodies dwell. Racial blackness is a social relationality rather than an identity, and this dwelling can be understood to constitute blackness. Blackness emerges from a process of ordering that consists of a series of spatial arrangements, the imposition of segregation and policing, policing that functions to order society, as well as the sedentarizing techniques, both discursive and material, that are employed when black people are out of place. I'm extending Barner Hesse's concept of the Western political defined as the process and the system where society is divided and classified, ordered by way of its Western colonial and racial constitution, to look specifically at the spatial creation and maintenance of this, of this colonial racial order. I call this concept Western spatiality. As an example of Western spatiality, the slave ship divides between colonizers and colonized, white and black, and enslaved women and enslaved men through the setting down of lines and creation of containers. But in this process of separation also produces these classifications. So not only would the slave trade have ceased to exist in the way it did without the technology of the slave ship, but the slave ship illustrates the central role of architecture in constituting structural positions, rather than simply implementing or supporting them. This is to say it is not the case that the slave ship is simply a physical rendering of difference or discrimination, but an indication of how spatial arrangements that are meant to house create difference. The enslaved are being constituted here through what Hortense Thillers calls vestibular cultural formation, where they are both made and unmade, where bodies are forced to pass into a new self via a spatial construction. The emergence of this self occurs as these stolen bodies move into and through the ship. On the ship, the co-constitution of race and gender hinged on where, when, and how these enslaved populations were made to take up space. Citing the Brooks plan, Spillers has argued that while the enslaved women and enslaved men were subject to different conditions, as quantifiable property, their only difference was how much space they took up in the hold. That quote, <clears throat> this is a long quote, that quote, every man slave is to be allowed six feet by one foot four inches for room, every woman five feet ten by one foot four, every boy five feet by one foot two, and every girl four feet by one foot. How slaves were configured in the hold was deliberate, carefully arranged so as not to let the slaves sit aboard the, the ship as passengers. Slave ships were consciously overpopulated, and their spatial configur configuration was at the heart of the slave's structural position as non-human. The spatial processes that mark out these bodies are incomplete but continuous. Alongside the hold, there's the barricado that I mentioned earlier, which was meant to mitigate the damage of rebellion by keeping the men to one side and violently striking them down from the side of the enslaved women and children. The separation gave crewmen even greater sexual access to the women who were located on the, on the gun deck along with them. The nettings allowed slave women to go unfettered, lead, lending credence to Catherine McKittrick's claim that, quote, locations of captivity initiate a de different sense of place through which black women can manipulate the categories and sites that constrain them. However, this relative liberty meant that the disciplinary production of the classification enslaved woman often occurred through their illimitable sexual exploitation by white slavers. Named docile in their separation from enslaved black men and hypersexual in their intimate proximity to the vulgar proclivities of the white crew, the enslaved black woman's position was formed through her spatial orientation. While all slaves were vulnerable to sexual violence, black women were especially at risk and their bodies were made the intentional locus through which the white crew compelled compliance. This captivity was meant to make visible, fabricated qualities such as violence and sexual lasciviousness and name them inherent to black populations, marking differences between the enslaved, but also between them and their captors. <clears throat> the slave ship produces the captive body, but the slave ship also serves as the site of this talk because it evinces the impossibility of an absolute spatial governance. 
It demonstrates the anxiety of securing stability in society's impossible attempt to achieve an absolute state. It is a space of perpetual motion sailing across the Atlantic, in between seemingly coherent places, which brings with it an uncertainty that must be continually studied and reconstituted through the production and maintenance of a fixed social order via the sedentarizing spatial practices I just discussed. In the gaps, or better still, producing these gaps are practices of rupture. These are the leaps that attempt to move beyond the master's firm grip. If the slave ship is meant for an optimum purpose, any practice that does not con contribute to this purpose contests this purpose. And jumps from the slave ship were happening as long as slavers were sailing. From Equiano's narrative to the account of British surgeon Alexander Falconbridge, there are numerous accounts of enslaved women jumping British, French, and Spanish ships. It was widely practiced by the enslaved and widely feared by the crews. However, there are cases when large groups of 30 to 100 slaves were known to have jumped. These ju jumps often occurred when unshackled enslaved women gave the crew the slit, successful if they were able to dodge the netting and the rescue parties that sought to return them. The slaves jump provide a blueprint for what can be called a black geography, which provide a different red-black vantage point from which to understand the production of segregated space. Exposing the classificatory spatial practice of the colonial racial order as they transgress them, these jumps also serve to reconfigure them. The effect of the slave's jump is not only the master's potential loss of individual property, but a breach of his spatial dominion and his command over the life of the slave. While seemingly minute in the grander scheme of slavery, the slave's disruptive re-inhabitation of the ship to live in a new accord with the ship's built environment that was not previously intended by design is a spatial transgression that questions the fundamental colonial racial relations that emerge from and through, oh sorry, that emerge from and structure the ship's existence. As such, the slave's jump can be understood as an attempt to open a new structural relationship. Yet, does the jump's total refusal, coupled with the absence of a prescription of this new relationship, augur its political limit? I turn to anarchist theory here because it can provide a framework of political practice that is neither beholden to any existing structures or centralizing authority, nor bound to any preordained alternative. I am offering anarchism as a method or practice rather than a strict ideology. To this extent, anarchism disrupts our typical ways of thinking and doing politics, inviting new perspectives of, new perspectives of enduring context. In short, it allows us to overcome the state as the sole frame for subject formation and transformative discourse and mobilization, as well as newly understand the slave's jump from the slave ship. To think about black anarchism is to reveal the productive intersection of anarchist modalities and black rap politics. Black anarchism is, of course, a kind of double descriptive. Black populations have long practiced extra-state political resistance inflected by anarchism in centuries of struggle against white supremacy and anti-blackness. Anarchist movements, for their part, include a long history of black militants and adhere to a philosophy of anti-authoritarianism that has strong and inherent links to black movements. Yet, as black anarchist groups have pointed out, black anarchist politics has been deceptively absent in the existing literature, rooted in classical anarchism's adherence to Western universalism, which actively mutes its relationship to blackness. The coupling of, a black, the coupling of black and anarchism, then, is not superfluous. It enunciates a need for anarchism to confront anti-blackness as a foundational mechanism of the state, the colonial ra racial centralizing authority that is always already <coughs> It simultaneously appeals to new geographies of black life that refuse to labor through a reconfiguration of the current order, susceptible to reproducing white domination. This agnosticism, however, is often the reason that anarchism generally, and black anarchism more specifically, are disregarded as inviolable and unsustainable. But my nomination of black anarchism, especially as, it, especially as it relates to the slave who jumps ship, invokes this inviability as a disengagement of order. This is not necessarily a claim to idealism or utopianism. utopianism. It also is not necessarily not that but is a refusal of a capitalist inflected cycle of reproduction. While absconding from her literal reproduction of the slave labor force and thus interrupting the West's means of production, the enslaved black woman's jump also refuses to replicate black submission to white will and impedes Western liberalism's linear continuous rebirth of itself. 
Because of the relative ease with which we can analyze the structure and participants of formal politics, its stories and outcomes have been at the forefront of our discussions of black politics. Yet the late Richard Eiten has charged the scholars of black politics not to overlook those spaces that generate difficult data. But our understandings of those difficult practices often come to us via a Western liberal lexicon. The practice of jumping the slave ship has never been narrated as politics substantively. Even as the slave ship has oriented the bodies aboard it, so too have we been oriented in our apprehension of it. The Western liberal tradition proposes a linear and allegedly progressive trajectory, but this linearity only comes to mystify and dematerialize a historic cycle of assimilation to a Western order of things, where assimilation is a specification of white and non-white articulation. Here I argue that assimilation is always already a reproduction of and for whiteness that makes blackness its necessary fount. But, liberal, but liberalism's inherent mechanism for reproduction is also its orientation moving toward a political horizon that already names its constituent, and I would add, permitted elements. Western political thought, knee-deep in a liberal genealogy, coheres around its own reproduction and upholds a Western normative of reproduction itself. This is a level of requirement that is constitutively foreclosed to the agnosticism of black anarchism. The focus of black anarchism is not the parameters of its outcomes, for this would make it susceptible to centralizing authority and would mean a reduction of its imaginative possibilities. To look too intense and, name, and to name it anarchism in the dialect of the West would be to call for a structure to which it is diametrically opposed. Black anarchism cannot adhere, adhere to a structural system that actually serves to discipline it to the point of placing its productivity under erasure. As such, Western liberalism's reproductive push is also its defense against other political orientations especially those that reveal its colonial racial authority. By effectively quarantining black anarchism to the apolitical, Western liberalism's framework for political participation stands freely. Black anarchism requires the undisciplined. Where many call for forms of dissent that respect the wider system of political propriety, the jump asserts a method of political practice that calls out this system as farce. And while black practices are often vilified as anarchy, their anarchistic quality may in fact actually be their productivity. Like a performance, the ephemerality of the jump of black anarchist practices requires us to revalue emptiness, that which is neither viable nor prescriptive. It is their movement outside the, or the frame of the given. Anarchy's counterpoint, law and order, the structure that is meant to give meaning to the conditions and position of both whites and blacks, is upended even if only briefly. Critics have failed to understand the value of black anarchism's expenditure, but this energy is only futile when we remain tied to the linearity of liberal progression. It is not merely the case that theorists are simply opposed to ascribing subst substantive political meaning, but that black practices and black anarchist practices in particular are antagonistic to the meaning making of Western liberal de democratic theory. Attempting to contest and exist outside a relation of domination, outside the very order that is meant to give meaning, the slave's jump is necessarily opaque. In our inherited understandings of Western politics and our inherited understandings of black politics, both have traditionally agreed that black anarchism is not politics. Our inheritance privileges hand-to-hand -hand engagement with the enemy as the only viable form of critique and relies on a reductive formula of means and ends, consequently pushing the self-immolating slave outside the frame. So I'm going to go into my section that's probably the most boring part of my chapter, because it's on insurance litigation, but I ask you to bear with me. So in the famous case of the Zong, the litigation... No, no, that's fine. Okay, that's better for me, thank you. Um, in the famous case of the Zong, the litigation is based in the question of risk. The risk of loss by dehydration and the risk of loss by rebellion. What is not, is, what is not discussed in this case, but what serves as, somewhat, as a somewhat obvious juxtaposition to those who are thrown in response to risk, are those who are in excess of risk because they jump. To be excessive in terms of insurance is to be too predictable too likely, too probable for any underwriter to promise compensation. In terms of slave ships, 
Rebellion is the most prominent example of an excess of risk in insurance underwriting. Rebellion was seen as almost guaranteed. The question becomes what differentiates rebellion, as it was alluded to in insurance underwriting and law, from slaves who jump over overboard in self-immolation. The archive will tell you it is the difference of inherent vice. In other words, it is a foreseeable circumstance of the slave trade that slaves would try to kill themselves, and as such would not be covered by insurance. Yet the regulations become murkier, murkier as they continue. In Jones v. Schmoll, those that committed suicide after a rebellion were not covered due to inherent vice. But those that attempted to escape were part of the general average, which is what the owners of the Zong um, tried to claim with the insurer's general average. This line was drawn with the belief that the nomination inherent vice did not include the desire to be free. Such a demarcation reveals the uneasy attempt to set standards on the confluence of the terms rebellion, suicide, and escape. In all cases, the slave is always considered a threat, a risk. However, the presupposition of a desire for freedom skews our understanding of rebellion. How and why does one differentiate between those that commit suicide and those that, escape, that attempt to escape in the case of those who jump? The, uh, the archive is unsettled in its dealings with this circumstance. But what does become increasingly clear is how the archive of insurance litigation and underwriting depends on outcomes that retroact retroactively determine intentionality. Maritime insurance litigation already constitutes a definition of rebellion that requires the physical loss of the ship to the control of the slaves by differentiating itself from escape. Yet in its move to differentiate between suicide and escape on the terms of desire further illustrates that its impact on the larger, further illustrates its impact on the larger narrative of rebellion. The practice of the slave jumping the slave ship reveals the limits, limits of such a series of delineations. How does one measure the desire to be free? Especially in a system that relies purely on outcomes. The terms suicide, escape, and rebellion, rebellion violently depoliticize the practice of jumping ship. Not only because the terms are steeped in a moral calculus of both failure and honor, but because the practice of jumping ship only retains its political effect with the survival of the slave. Such a reduction imagines a particular trajectory for the success of resistance. In so doing, to dismiss self-immolation eases us out of the conundrum of difficult data, those acts that put pressure on our limited understanding of political practice. Maritime litigation, one of the primary archives from which we have come to study the experience of slaves aboard slave ships, has led us to rely on an outcome model that has thereby restricted us to an understanding of rebellion that requires a knowable end. To be limited to the prefigurative means to be characterized by the dismissal of any possibilities beyond the already existing. While some scholars have perceived the slave's self-inflicted death as a form of defiance, they have done so in contradistinction to some historians who have downplayed its significance. Much of this friction is due to a stigmatized culture surrounding suicide that follows in the footsteps of Durkheim's thesis, implying that the maturity of a slave community would deter slaves from killing themselves, thereby forwarding the practice as an indicator of the unseasoned and underdeveloped. This is further buttressed by our gender definitions of rebellion. The barricado bears significance in so much as it shapes and is shaped by the tropes of the hypermasculine enslaved man as the source of rebellion and the docile enslaved black woman that has attributed the nomination of lesser danger. The barricado reflects and refracts our conception of what rebellion looks like, where it takes place, and who practices it. Jumping ship as political practice is thus unaccounted for in the barricado's calculus of rebellion. Instead, the slave, who jumps sla sorry, the slave who jumps ship is entrusted to the ship's netting. The language used to describe the slave's self-destructive self self abstention is couched in giving up preference and getting quit of one's misery. Thus, where the barricado unsees the willfulness of enslaved black women, the netting's name enslaved black women as hyper-effective and irrational. Absented from the nomination of rebellion, the fact of self-immolation is reduced to a suicidal surrender where suicide is often coded as feminine. 
Descriptions of slave suicides were prevalent in the 19th century with stories littering newspapers and autobiographies and images of slave women taking their own life becoming icons in anti-slavery writing. While there are examples of suicide that are read as males, such as self-sacrifice in war or Republican challenge to tyranny, those instances of suicide that appear to constitute surrender rather than a choice are mapped as the practices of women. Such a gendering of suicide not only presumes illegible intentionality, but is also circumscribed by a narrative structure that names men more willful than women. Unlike an armed uprising, which was often the provenance of enslaved men aboard the ship, self-immolation differs in its rejection of colonial racial authority through a practice of escape that antagonizes Western spatiality by threatening its arrangement of containment, of containment and the slave's position as contained, threatening the master's property, rule, and sovereignty, the master's order, and the master order. Yet, the slave cannot dispose of her, her sin without committing a sort of larceny. This theft is realized in the gratuitous punishment that is its consequence, meant to reassert the slave's non-human life and fungibility. The ocean, which was the primary portal of escape, was also what Hartman calls a loophole of retreat, a space of both freedom and captivity. This tension appears as the practice of jumping the slave ship sits antithetically against traditional analyses of political descent. While it is not the death of the slave that is antagonistic to the master's will, but the self-immolation of the slave, this black anarchistic practice has no purchase. Not only unrecognizable, unrecognizable because it lacks a viable outcome, but because it signifies a desire that eclipses the narrative of civil rights and emancipation. As such, slaves' self-immolation has been largely overlooked, an epistemic violence that effectively doubles the brutalization of the slave. Some have made the mistake of neglecting self-immolation as a political practice, either equating the slave's jump with immaturity or with hysteria. Such an assertion is at best an oversight, and at worst an indication of the West's specification of black political disengagement in the moment of rupture where white jurisdiction and the ablation of black political practice is normalized without any reference to slavery's structural positions. By way of its presuppositions, the designations of insane or immature preemptively exclude any reference to the social death of the slave trade and the positions it engenders. Black anarchist practice is refused in narrative structure, and a history of colonial racial order is de dematerialized. In other words, by foreclosing the referent, Slaves jump from the slave ship is easily excised from our political landscape. This is the antagonism of black anarchism's ephemerality and unreproductivity to a Western liberal order that coheres around its own repetition and reflection. So to conclude, I'd like to return to Pip. For me, what has always been most arresting about Pip's story is that after his jump, his speech, while clearly coherent when you read it, is heard as babble. It's heard as mutter. In this, we find the crisis of legibility at the heart of black anarchism. While Pip's jumps upend the social fabric of a ship, he rejects a position that is as yet unrecognizable as a position. So while this jump moves the slave out of place, the slave cannot be incorporated as the subject that the jump intends to invoke. Pip's attempt to speak, a deep and seemingly prophetic babble, clarifies the inability to bear witness to black suffering within the confines of Ishmael's narration. His black anarchist practice against the racial governance of the ship is untenable as political practice because racial governance is not yet understood as the ship's structure. The horizons of the Western political have shaped how black practices have been known, dictating how we understand dissent and protest outside the prefigurative frame. This frame is itself an enclosure. Held to the standards of traditional Western political thought, the black anarchist movement of the slave's jump is deemed irrational and evacuated of any comprehensible, comprehensible political potential. Our deference to a conceptual terrain structured by a Western liberal political horizon has limited our purview and any understanding of black anarchism has suffered. My work thus considers this conceptual terrain's value to the, race, to the colonial racial order and the precarity of black unrest which serves to extend black subjection. The point is not to simply to name these actions as political, but to recognize how the very understanding of what is political holds space for white supremacy and anti-blackness, denying the reference of black practices and restricting our imaginative futures. Western liberalism's political horizon is orientating. It constitutes our field of vision 
establishing our view of what is and what is not in reach, marking out the known and familiar. Black anarchism works to push to the surface exactly those tensions and possibilities that are necessarily suppressed and denied. Thrusting themselves off the bulwarks and into the ocean, the slaves turn their back on this horizon. But the jump remains in the interval, in between a descent from slavery and any possible future outside its grasp, its prodigious slash falling on deaf ears. Thank you. more about the zone because and, and particularly you know this groups mm -hmm. insistence on all the silences around that recovery. I'm sorry, all the silence around just recovering it for herself as a writer. Yes, and yes, yes. And so, yeah. I want to see how you would take mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I think for me I had another question. Oh sorry, go ahead. No no No, the other one was Antizomatic is and I was wondering if you looked at um, I can't remember the author's name, but the title is If We Must Die, it's based on Clover Key's poem. But it's about a number of slave insurrections. Oh, so yes, yes, yes. That is not the real anarchism, really taking down the ship. And of course, there are many incidents of, of, of that happening and creating other communities outside, mm -hmm. as the Esmeraldas mm -hmm. in Ecuador, or the Creole incident in the Hamas and several others. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't that be stretching it a little further if you went there, or do you go there? Yeah. Great, so Those great questions. questions. So the first question in terms of silence and recovery, you know, it's not at all that I'm trying to kind of necessarily recover, you know, these, these moments. It's more, you know, what can looking at these practices through the lens of black anarchism allow us to see, especially about how silence is created around political practices. Um, so that's how I would kind of approach that. The Zong is a really interesting kind of um, juxtaposition, right? Because you have slaves who are thrown versus slaves who jump. And so for me, it was really interesting to look at. And, you know, I've never been one to, the other reason anarchism is so important to, to me in terms of providing a lens is I'm not focused on the intentionality of the slaves because it's impossible to know, right? And I think that's part of what you know, Phillips is saying in terms of these silences that cannot be recovered. And that's a silence that cannot be recovered. And I don't think it should be, right? Because I think to be so tied to their intentionalities is, again, to end up being circumscribed by these lineages of what successful protest looks like, right? Um, but to answer your second question, which kind of dovetails with your first for me, is I'm not offering black anarchism in a type of typology. I'm not that kind of political theorist. And um, it's not about, you know, this is black anarchism, this isn't, this is not, this isn't. It's more about what can black anarchism and that lens provide us in terms of this, in terms of the study of black politics, right? Because I'm never going to be one that's going to say, if someone were to say, you know, I have students all the time, who are like, well, would this be black anarchist? I'm like, I don't know. You tell me. You know, in terms of the lens I've given you, what do you think it is, right? And because it's not about saying what it's not. You know, it's kind of saying what would, if it is, and you want it to be that, what would that allow us to think about? What would that allow us to do in terms of the practice? Because I think what's, what's really important about the archive and what about the silences is we have to very much respect the silences, right? And um, I think part of that is also not only respecting the silences, but respecting the secrets. And, um, you know, that's something I do in my project. You know, it's, I start with slaves who jump the slave ship, and I deal with silence. And my last chapter is on Asada Shakur, and I deal with secrets. And the, it's specifically the kind of the, the fugitive chapter, right, that is the chapter in between prison and Cuba. So what does it mean to think about both simultaneously? And I think black anarchism, you know, is really pushing us to think about how is the unknown productive and how is it okay to be unknown? Oh, I don't even know if this is a question or ten questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really thinking of the question of uh, intentionality that you just raised. Because, okay, one, I wonder if you can say more about your understanding of anarchism, because mm -hmm. anarchism is really predicated on <coughs> moral claims. I'm sorry? Oh, on moral mm -hmm. claims mm -hmm. of okay. what, and what the individual is and what freedom is. Mm -hmm. So how can we take the, slave on, the enslaved on the ship and not consider mm -hmm. 
the place of origin, which may have had specific geography or what freedom means mm -hmm. and what the individual is. Mm -hmm. How does he mean to take this? I mean, this, this slave from that specific point, which is the ship, which you say is constitutive of some certain actions. Mm -hmm. So how, I'm not looking for anthropological mm -hmm. and, and anthropological answer, but how do we conceptually think about the place of origin mm -hmm. and the prevailing belief system about? Because, for example, in some contexts, suicide is a prescribed response mm -hmm. for expectations for having indulged in certain practices. Mm -hmm. The community will expect you to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. That will be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is, can you differentiate between an enslaved such as Pete's? People, yeah. yeah, people who had lived on, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and been you know, on the ship, and the ones who are just coming from mm -hmm. the continent, how do we differentiate conceptually mm -hmm. between these two? So, in a nutshell, I'm asking, how do we conceptualize the place? Because I understand we don't have access to the interiority of the enslaved. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, mm -hmm. and I really admire the kind of work I do. But how do we conceptualize how they were living in the kinds of prevailing? Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. And you know, it's you know, oftentimes I get the question about intentionality, right, and about what successful rebellion looks like, and kind of, and what the typology is, right, saying, well, it is different than rebellion because they had, they wanted to do something and then they wanted to die, and there's, I mean, there's a couple things there that are problematic with that, right? Obviously, it's based on this very moral calculus. If there's a success, what success does it look like? But also, it just completely disregards African cosmologies, right, where jumping from the slave ship doesn't necessarily mean death. For some, right? No. It's a, it, it just it means a return, right? And so, so for me, um, those things always have to be held into account, right? In terms of thinking about you know where these folks are coming from, in terms of those cosmologies. Um, but again, I, I don't focus on intentionality because mm -hmm. because I just it, it just can't, right? It's impossible. But how can you talk about anarchism without intentionality? So so for me, it's thinking about anarchism is not necessary. It's not. I don't tie it to an ideology. And I don't tie it to a coherent ideology. For me, in terms of what Lucy Parsons says, in terms of what Jack Halberstam has said recently, right, it's about a disruption in our ways of thinking and doing, mm -hmm. right. And so it's me uh, focusing. For my project, was it's focusing on practices in and of themselves as being important and what they do. And for me, so I have a chapter, and I hate to bring this up because it's probably going to cause questions, but I have a chapter on um, the Black Star Line. Mm -hmm. yes. And um, any time I give talks and I use the word anarchism and Black Star Line in the same talk, the first response is, you can't call that anarchism. Garvey's an imperialist. Garvey's a black imperialist. And I mean, that's already a separate discussion, but I think for me it's always about, you know, we, these practices that we have kind of are, go far beyond what our intentions could ever mean, right? And so black anarchism is kind of a lens, right, that I can use to think about the productivities of those things. Because, for example, with, with Marcus Garvey and, and the Black Star Line, we've gotten so inundated or stuck in this idea that the Black Star Line economically was just this failed venture. Mm -hmm. And okay, fine, if we want to talk about its economic threat, then okay, we can talk about the fact that it wasn't doing much, right? But, you know, those voyages let the coconuts rot in the hole because it wasn't about the economics, right? It was about so much more than that. It was about the kind of symbolism, the political symbolism to Jamaicans, right? And to all these other folks um, across the diaspora. And so for me, yes, Marcus Garvey may have imperialist intentions and the Back to Africa movement is, has strong intentions, but these practices can be understood and thought about and thought through outside of those intentionalities. Yes. Hey, um, thank you very much for that. Talk. So I have two quite separate questions. Okay. So I am really a historian in real life. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> the, I always get nervous when they raise the <laughs> I'm not gonna, I mean, one of the things I want you to spin out a little bit is I really love um, the way that you talked about the racialization of space on the slave ship, and I really appreciate the metaphor of the jump. And I, I, I was just uh, ener super energized by thinking of of the jump um, as a kind of deliberate act of a particular kind. But moving it forward through some of the other spaces that are racialized, mm -hmm. um, like the prison, um, it, just take the prison, what would be the analogy for the jump 
I mm -hmm. guess, mm -hmm. and how would you write that? So that's one uh -huh. okay. question. The other thing is, um, you know, and of course I'm all about India, right? So I'm just going to ask my question. Yeah. And you, you don't have to know the answer, but if you do, <laughs> I I'd love to hear it. So you know, um, you know that Amitabh Ghosh's trilogy mm -hmm. starts, yes. the yes. Poppy starts with the retrofitted slave ship that is um, then meant to carry opium, mm -hmm. right, from India to China. And um, I shouldn't give it away, right? But anyway, I'm not going to give it away. But the ship then comes to contain all of these different kinds of bodies that are quite distinct racially and in terms of caste and so on, right? And the ship in that novel becomes a metaphor for what the seas look like, which are quite different mm -hmm. than the other spaces of the colony, right? Um, and then the, gosh, now I'm going to forget which novel, then the port city is the site in the final one, right, mm -hmm. of the trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's obviously kind of thinking with and against the framework of, of spatializing mm -hmm. these different racial categories, mm -hmm. right? But what I thought was quite persuasive about your talk was that the slave ship really is a kind of important framework, right, for rethinking that. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could just talk about yeah, that. Yeah, okay, so that, yeah, great question. I think I'll start with your second one, mm -hmm. and then go to your first. So um, I don't know much about India, mm -hmm. but I do know that what's really great about Amitabh Ghosh's work in terms of see of poppies and thinking about retrofitting is slave ships were retrofitted, right? It's not like when the slave trade started that they already had ships made for, you know, for, for uh, what you call it, for slavery, right? It was, they were retrofitting the ships and it's such an important for me thinking about the production of these racialized bodies because the barricado is added to the ship. The holds are changed to, um, you know, account for human cargo, right? So many things about the ship are changed in order to produce this space, right? And part of it is, you know, they're doing it as it goes, right? So the barricado wasn't there in the very beginning, right? The barricado becomes something that they install because of these problems, these quote-unquote problems that they're having. So I think, um, you know, retrofitting is something I'm always thinking about and how she, it's how spaces are always being fixed and moved. And that's part of the reason why ships are so important as the kind of analogy or the origin story is what I call it in terms of thinking about carcerality, right? Because we're so often, we have origin stories about mass incarceration, right? Um, we have Foucault, Discipline and Punish, and the kind of peddling of Bentham's Panopticon, and then we have um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. We have all these origin stories. And a lot of those origin stories, either they're, they don't account for racialized bodies and racialized history, which is Foucault's issue. And then, you know, with, um, with Michelle Alexander's work, she takes a rather liberal lineage, right? And she kind of has a liberal take on what the solution is to the prison. She says, it needs reform, right? It's a discrimination issue. Um, but both of those think about carcerality as something very fixed, right? And by beginning with those types of things, we end up having an understanding of carcerality that's very fixed. And with black populations, you have to think about how punishment has always been about movement with black populations, with forced movement, with, and, you know, in terms of slavery, and, then, and today in terms of electronic monitoring, right, and, and kind of surveillance. And um, for me, it's tracking that. So the reason that I think ships being on the ocean is so important is because they're places that are always moving and thus always have to be re reconstituted through fixity, mm -hmm. right, and how movement is used to punish. Right? Not simply to transport you know, the incarcerated from, to, from cell to cell or from prison to prison, but thinking about how their move it, movement in and of itself is criminalized. Right? My last chapter uses a conceptualized, I conceptualize what I call vagrant blackness. Right? Because there's this idea that vagrancy, which becomes what I call a catch-all to catch-all. Right? Because vagrancy is used as a way in which, you know, for the black codes, it's Anytime they don't have a, a job, they don't have a home, they're, they're standing too long in the, on the street, there's illegal assembly, all these ways in which they move right, are improper. And that's the ways in which they're, they're criminalized. And um, the, the, I think the slave ship always allows me to do that, right, to think about those things. Um, in terms of the analogy, you know, so the re how it came to be in terms of thinking through these multiple different practices was, you know, first it was Pip, and then it was the slaves who jumped the slave ship. And then I was thinking about, you know, there's something that really resonates about any time that black 
people are on ships. And especially in the case of the Black Star Line, you have black people steering ships instead of being in the hold. And so I thought that's a really important moment. We have to think about that. And then I was listening to Aswan, and they have this beautiful song, Concrete Slave Ship, when they're talking about you know, um, the ghetto and, and projects. And so that's when I started to look at the Watch Rebellion. Right? And so thinking about, first for the Watch Rebellion, the slave ship in that case would be you know, the creation of the ghetto, right? the, what we also would call the concrete slave ship. And I look in particular at the way in which um, housing um, is, has like, been privatized. And so I, I do a lot of reading on like the night in the 1970s moment um, where like Oscar Newman's kind of understanding of defensible space is being employed to think about how to fix Nickerson Gardens, post-rebellion, right? thinking about all these things and the ways in which, in the language, it's this kind of capitalist privatization of space, where you want to break up communities, right? They keep saying, you know, these, we need, we, we have to get rid of common spaces. Too many common spaces means that these, these folks don't have ownership over these places, and because they don't have ownership, they don't take care of these places, but of course it, it interrupts black descent, right? So the jump from the slave ship for me in that chapter is property destruction. I think it asks the question, whose property? Right, and Asada Shakur says it in um, what's I think it's the one that she wrote for the, that ends up it ends up getting published in the Black Scholar in 1981. She says, you know, whose property? Like, this has never been our property. What, so you know, they keep saying that they're everyone. You know, you're burning down. Look at these people burning down their own neighborhoods, and I think it actually provokes a question, right? And then in terms of the prisons, um, I look at Asada Shakur's escape from prison as the jump from slave ship. But I, you know, I, I really put pressure on kind of the success of it, right? So I call it escapism. I don't call it escape because it's about not necessarily this one directional movement. It's not about, you know, the destination. It's kind of about her movement throughout. Because right now she's still in carceral exile, right? So those kinds of the, the nation state ends up getting shore, shoring up its boundaries by putting her by having her in Cuba and still putting these um, these billboards up in New Jersey. Right? And so there's this kind of carcerality that's created, this non-home for black people. You're not here, not you. You can't do these things. Um, so that's kind of how I think about the analogy. I think about it as more of a different origin story, right? Because I think our origin stories bring us to particular places, right? The ways in which Foucault talks about the prison, you know, and how, it, how it, it, its history invokes a particular, you know, imprisoned subject that's not a black person. And it doesn't account for, you know, the fact that in, in mass incarceration, it's disproportionate numbers of black men and women. And so I think thinking about the slave ship allows us to push back on that. I, I don't mean to, to beat the drum of intentionality of <laughs> that talk, by the way, okay. first of all. Uh, but I keep coming back to, to Pitt mm -hmm. and, you know, Pitt's jumps, mm -hmm. you know, from the ship. And, and how um, you sort of lay out these tensions between um, sort of the illegibility and you know the, the how sort of anarchism resists meaning making, which mm -hmm. I thought was very provocative and compelling. But I'm 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 also wondering like, also illegible to whom? Mm -hmm. And then um, you know if 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 Pip's sort of language is like ultimately I mean it's it's illegible to like you know the, the white men on the ship. Mm -hmm. You know I guess that would answer the whom. But also, um, it is legible to someone, mm -hmm. and, and I'm wondering if that um, I don't know. Maybe we can't interrogate the intentionality or the or the why, but I'm wondering if there is a message that's being communicated, like as some sort of directional impulse mm -hmm. that, that's being expressed and by just, by Pip. By Pip. Okay. By Pip. Yeah, you know, it's 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 hard with Pip. I don't. The reason I don't like to talk about Pip's intentionality is because. It's you know I, I, uh, it's it's fiction right and I can't ask Pip but there is <laughs> but there is something to be said about the fact that Ishmael describes when Ishmael describes the Pip's jump he says it's because he was afraid of whales that's why he jumps <laughs> and if you ask C L R James why Pip's jump Pip jumps he has a very Marxist take on it very Marxist take which is all well and good except it ends up he ends up saying that Pip's jump is kind of a, a an illustration of, of the condition of all the crew versus the officers, which does not account for the racial kind of inflection of Pitt. And what's really interesting about Melville, I think, I don't know, you know, Melville's an interesting guy. I never know what's intentional and what's not, but I always know that he's saying a lot of things. And, you know, everyone always expects when I do, um, when I talk, say that I'm, you know, I work on slavery, everyone thinks, well, I must be reading Benito Serena. But I'm not. 
I'm reading Moby Dick, and there's so mm -hmm. much done there. In, in his chapter on knights and squires, he starts to list all the characters. And at one point he's naming the officers, and he talks about Stubb, and he keeps talking about Stubb's pipes. He said, black pipes in a row. Mm -hmm. Pipes, pipes, pipes. And then a couple pages later, he's talking about Pip, black boy, right? And so there's something there. But what's really interesting is they're listed in almost like this weird proximity to blackness, right? Pip is listed last. The one before him is Dagu, the African harpooner. And then before him is Tashi. So there's this strange kind of um, delineation done. So anyway, I say all that to say that uh, Melville was doing something. He was provoking our thinking. But I'd never really know kind of what to take on in terms of intentionality or directionality. For me, it's kind of discerning what does Ishmael's narration not allow us to see. And he reads it very clearly. You know, you read that chapter and you want to, like, you close the book and you're just like, you're disgusted with Ishmael. Because Pip is just drowned. And he ends it and he, he literally says, you know, we'll, we'll soon see what like abandonment befell myself. Like, there's no concern with what Pip has gone through. It's like a half a paragraph and then all of a sudden we're talking about Ishmael. Because he's like the central figure. And then later, at the very end of the book, he's... Um, He's bobbing in the ocean, almost exactly identical to Pip, and he's riding a coffin, and he bursts out of a black bubble. So Neville was doing something and kind of allowing us to see something, but I don't know necessarily in terms of intentionality. But I think I, I think to kind of, I, I take up Pip to think about, well, why isn't this meaning discussed? Right? Why why is it that scholars haven't taken up the fact that Stubb invokes his slave price so directly? Right? And there's so many constant references to slavery. And if you're not looking for them, you're not necessarily going to see them. Right? But Pip, the first time he goes, um, quote unquote, the, the first time he talks right after he's gone that mad, he's reciting a, um, a runaway slave ad. And he goes, Pip, Pip, where's Pip? Five foot, like five foot tall, da da da, dark and like this is, he keeps, he's reciting a runaway slave ad. And so you have to think about that. Right? And so I'm always thinking about the Maroons, I'm always thinking about runaway slaves, I'm always thinking about fugitivity. And I couldn't cover it all within the dissertation, but it was kind of me thinking conceptually and me looking at these different historical moments. But I never want to say, well, that's just because I've said these four things are anarchism, then these 18 things aren't. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, you might have actually, I'm sorry, it was a few minutes late, so you might have uh, mentioned this before in your talk. But um, I was struck by the fact that you were referring to the folks on the ship as slaves as opposed to enslaved. But mm -hmm. then when you talk about incarceration, you're you're talking about the incarcerated yes. and not convicts. So mm -hmm. what was the? Yeah, you know, I think that was just a slippage. Um, they are. It's definitely. I would say I usually use enslaved. I think sometimes I shorten it when I think of the slave jump the ship. But it's definitely enslaved. Yeah. But no, thank you for that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. I like your uh, response to the question that you preemptively posed about the Garvey's Black Star Line. <laughs> I feel like it's easier if I just get ahead of it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, think that, I think that worked really well. Um, and, and, you know, you, you even got into the, that a little bit more in talking about, you know, um, black people being the, the, the pilots of the ships. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you, you, you could talk about it more, I'm sure, if you, if, if you wanted. But I wanted to to ask you about the, the, the moment um, of riotous property destruction. Mm -hmm. And I assume that you're talking about the 1960s and yes. maybe within the US, mm -hmm. uh, a US context. I was just wondering if you could, or if you think about that in terms of a global context, mm -hmm. the way one could talk about Garvey uh, you know, I, I think what was so uh, radical and subversive about Garvey was was the global influence. Mm -hmm. And, and um, when you think about a sort of a worldwide African diaspora mm -hmm. and, and and riots, you had riots in um, you know certainly um, colonial Africa. Mm -hmm. You you had obviously in, and more recently in fact. Riots and property damage in Britain mm -hmm. uh, and France, you know, the, the, the Van Loo. So I'm just wondering if, if you, if you, if thinking about that phenomenon and that that form of disruption mm -hmm. in that global mm -hmm. setting allows you to get out of the sort of the domestic U.S. Mm -hmm. discourses yeah. of see, well, these people are destroying their own communities mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, so it, it's interesting, you know, with all my other chapters, the global kind of quality is very much present. And slave ships are global. In terms of um, Asajj Kors, thinking about the relationship to Cuba and the U.S. And then obviously with Garvey, it's, you know, these global, uh, these transnational trips. But yeah, my, my, my chapter is on specifically the Watts Valley, right, of 65. That being said, I think it's important to think about what's going on at the same time at that moment. Because for me, I'm not a historian, but I kind of wanted to look at the project and move through time a little bit. So like, obviously, it's, you know, the, it's, there's many centuries covered in terms of the slave ship, slave, the enslaved to jump the slave ship. And then there's, you know, the 1920s. Um, and then there's the 1960s. And then it's thinking about the 1970s to now. Um, but I think it would be important to think about, you know, especially what's going on at Brixton, right, in the Brixton Valley, um, going on at the same, um, around the same period, and thinking about those moves. Um, but I, you know, I, I just haven't, I think, I think, but I think I would, it would be, I'd be better served if I thought about kind of the global um, situation. I think for me, when I was looking at the Walks Rebellion, my sources and what I'm looking at are very local. So I'm looking at, so I went into the um, archives at Berkeley thinking I was going to find um, kind of literature on police tactics and, um, and spatial designs. And what I ended up finding was letters. Just letters upon letters upon letters upon letters from quote unquote concerned citizens, right? From all over the US, right? Coming into the mayors saying, you know, you need to beat these children down. What are you like? Like, there was amazing kind of what was being said, and that ended up kind of making the project more and more localized yeah. in terms of that chapter. Um, but I think it would be important to think about kind of how the national boundaries are also being shored up at this time, thinking about rebellion more globally. Yes. Thank you. That was really, no, thank you. Really, um, really good to think with. Um, I, I have a sort of very open-ended query, which is, I'd love to hear you talk, you touched upon it, but I'd love to hear you say more about how you um, would situate the jump as a form of um, political practice in relation to um, forms of containment or s spatialization that are more about gender or sexuality. Mm. I see. So you mean just, OK, so. I mean, in the talk, in the material you've given, you're mostly focused on the kind of jump out of a racial, mm -hmm. particularly kind mm -hmm. of carceral racial condition. Yeah. So I just wondered. Yeah, so for me, whenever I look at race, I always look at gender, right? And so thinking about kind of, in, specifically, it's the reason why I start with enslaved the enslaved jump in the slave ship. Because for me, part of the reason that it's been completely ignored as a political practice is because it's black women, right? So it categorically, just we just assume, well, they're just giving up this surrender, right? We don't have an account, a political account, of Margaret Garner, you know, killing her children, mm -hmm. or this mm -hmm. moment, right? And it's because it, the, it does something to the psyche when you see a woman, you know, kill herself, right? The idea that she's supposed to be the nurturer, she's supposed to bring life and is now ending life, right? Either her own, whether she's pregnant or not, right? And so for me, I'm always thinking about how the two are mutually constitutive, right? I never kind of take one um, from a, apart from each other. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said in terms of how we think about rebellion and um, how we think about protest. I mean, in the Watts chapter, we, um, um, I mean, I, I talk about how, you know, it was, it was it's really interesting that you know, a lot of participants in the Watts Rebellion were black women, but the way it gets talked about is as if it was only black men, right? It's, it happens again in 1992, right? Black women are simply, you know, getting diapers, right? They're not participating actively in the rebellion. And so I think it's always, I'm always kind of considering the gender conceptualization, right? Um, I, you know, Sasha Kaur is a perfect example. I, I, I end with her also to kind of, as a bookend for the project, to think about you know, what does being a black woman in the United States mean? And what does it mean for her to be called a terrorist? For her to be, you know, added to the most wanted terrorist list. <coughs> the most woman to be added. Because we, we think in a post-9-11 world that the label terrorist is the provenance of, you know, Arab Americans or Arabs and Muslims, right? When I think Asada Shakur actually shows us that the black woman is still integral to the ways in which the United, to the, to the West, Right, and it's kind of creation of, of the terrorist idea. 
And, um, you know, those, uh, for example, uh, another example I would have in terms of thinking about gender, uh, the, the kind of gendered ways we understand things is, you know, those, the, um, the, the what do you call billboards, right, that go up in Jersey, right? They're not for Asadish poor, right? They're for everyone else. And it becomes this, like, literally signposting the home or non-home of black people, right? Here's this, her, her face in black and white, it says murderer, or it says like murder of law enforcement officer, it calls her a terrorist, it uses an AKA as if Asada Shakur is like a criminal alias, like she's in the mob, right? So there's this way in which her criminalization is invoked because of the intersections, right, of her race, gender, and sexuality, right? And, you know, Victoria Law has done a lot of work on this in terms of thinking about um, protests in prisons. We often think that protest is just something that does not happen in women's prisons, right? But the August Rebellion of 74 will tell you differently, and Asada Shakur will tell you differently. And for me, it's thinking about, well, how are these silences created? And I think it very much has to do with the ways in which these folks are interrupting reproduction in a very particular way that is, you know, kind of, is mystified in the kind of, um, in the Western liberal tradition. Yeah. Um. So thank you, and I, I just have to say, I thought that the insurance discussion was incredibly interesting. Thank you. <laughs> so I just, that's just one listener's response, thank but um, you. I was really into that. Um, so I just wanted to follow on that question to say then, you know, I, I, I get this notion that the, the jump is gendered female, mm -hmm. right, Inter and the passive response as opposed to the proactive mm -hmm. rebellion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then what do, you, what, do you, what do you do with the fact that Pip is male? You know, it's interesting, and it's, it, what, but what I think is interesting about Pip is he's a child, right? And especially on the slave ships, the children were grouped with the women. Um, and so I think what we, it's, what's really interesting about that is there's kind of, again, there's this infantilization of, of black people generally, but specifically black women, right? And this kind of idea that they must be with the, they must be with the women, right? Even though, you know, we don't know where these, the parents of these children are. I mean, they could only have a father that's still alive, and they could be on the other side, but they're grouped with the women. And so for me, thinking about Pip always means thinking about the ways in which infantilization is often gendered, which it, it often means thinking about children and women that are often grouped together. In prisons, you have to think about... Um, so in, in, in prison architecture, there's a shift in the early... I believe it's the early 80s... Um, from the telephone pole style of, um, of, of prisons, to a kind of campus style. And um, what's interesting about the campus style is it was used, it was a style that was used to house juveniles and women because the idea was they needed increased supervision. And so there's a way in which thinking about children, about black children, always requires us to think about who they're often paired with. Um, that being said, he is he's a boy, right? Um, but I think there's no women on the on Moby Dick's boat, um, um, on the, um, on the Pequot, um, but I think it's a good point, and I have to always, I'm always thinking about kind of the ways in which also, you know, black women are never really gendered as quote-unquote women, right? Their, their, their gender is always built in excess, right, in contradistinction to white women. So they're always pushing against or in excess of our, our categories. Yes. Sorry, I, I just have to ask one more <laughs> question. I guess the, the, uh, Moderator's prerogative, yeah. or whatever. But anyway, um, the images that you used, yes. uh, there was one really striking one that I think uh, opens up these questions of the sort of spatial dimension mm -hmm. of, of the slave ship. And it's the, it's the one where someone is jumping through the netting. Mm -hmm. and, and then on mm -hmm. the, the below deck, mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, I don't know, I guess the, the, the captives who were, who were sort of um, crammed in there. Mm -hmm. And and I, I just had a question about the provenance of, of, of that particular image. And if you could just talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the uh, an apparent revolt and, and revolts of, of, you know, a, a different character taking place on top as opposed to what's going on in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And this, this one person on the bottom who is sort of mm -hmm. physically sort of lashing out mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. the others are, are 
at, at least more still. Mm -hmm. So if you could just talk more about yeah, so the, the image is, and where it comes from. Yeah, the more. image is uh, it's interesting. You, if you try to look up slaves who jump the slave ship, it's very hard to find an image. Um, very, very hard. And so the this image and the image of the slave rebellion, right? The slave rebellion, the slave, where they're, um, they're, there's all this fighting and there's three um, enslaved folks jumping mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. Those are like the only two pictures mm -hmm. that you can find. Um, and so what's interesting about, first of all, what's always struck me is the ways in which um, the bodies are rather ungendered, mm -hmm. right? So you can't see what, what, what you know, who is jumping, which is so interesting because in the narratives, in the autobiographies that you'll find, like Equiano or, mm -hmm. or in, in Alexander Falconbridge's account, or even when you look at ship logs, mm -hmm. it's almost always women that are jumping, right? And I think what's interesting about this one is also there's, a, you know, it's not clear if there's a rebellion happening right now, but it seems that way. But again, the only time you find images of slaves jumping ship are, is when it's counterposed to rebellion. Um, which is again interesting because in the archives, it's often something that's done just whenever they can, they, they're able to slip free, right? It's not like it's, it's not like it's necessarily a response to the rebellion. And what's interesting about these illustrations is it's always how it's posed, right? Um, the rebellion being the response to the whole, the jump being re the response to the rebellion. Um, and so I, it's, it's hard, right, because we don't have photographs, right? We just have artist renderings. And I think, again, those artist renderings are just as kind of suspect as, you know, the ship's logs, right? The ways in which the, the, the slave, the enslaved to jump the slave ship are talked about, right? Um, because their references are actually quite brief to them, right? It's this, uh, they're in one in the slave ship, um, Lawrence, there's like in you know 300 pages of microfilm. There's like one reference to two woman slaves who jump, but we rescued them. With their so there's really interesting language also used. Um, but it's interesting because it wasn't happening during rebellion, right? And it's, like, it's literally like they talk about the weather that day, and they talk about how they counted earlier that day, and then it says this, and then it just moves on to the next one. And so there's a way in which the artist renderings always.